Um, Thank you so much. I'm Amy Dacey. I'm the executive director here at the Sign Institute. I want to quickly thank and thank you for your patience. We're so excited to get the program started. I want to thank our co-sponsors this evening, the School of Public Affairs, the School of Communications, and AU's Alumni Association are all collaborating with us, with us this evening to present to you Grace, President Obama in 10 Days in the Battle for America. I know you've all been waiting for this conversation. Um, we are so pleased that Cody Keenan is back on campus with us here at the Sign Institute. From, you know, rising from a campaign intern in Chicago to director of speech writing at the White House, Cody's had an unbelievable um, career history, and he honored us by becoming one of our signed fellows here in 2020, um, my first cohort of fellows, and really spent time with us on campus. It was an interesting semester, if you remember, Cody, because... Halfway through, we um, were experiencing COVID and we switched to virtual events. So it's good to have you back in person. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know we have another member of your cohort uh, from, from that season, uh, Catherine Miller, somewhere in the audience. So Catherine, thank you so much for being here, a fellow fellow of Cody's. Um, we also have Kristen Bartoloni. Where is she? She's home oh. with the baby. Oh, she's home with the baby. Well, she's our AU alum, but she's also Cody's wife, and we're so happy that um, there's a proud eagle in the family um, as well. So um, we are joined, and we are going to have uh, interview Cody tonight, Peter Alexander, who many of you know. Peter, welcome to campus. Thank welcome so here to American University, the co-anchor of the weekend broadcast of today co-chief White House correspondent. He has been with NBC News since 2004, and he's covered events around the world. You've seen him in some of our deepest, darkest times and some of our joys. He has brought us uh, the news. And, and in a time of such you know, uh, difficult times where we're trying to navigate this, having a journalist who sees the importance of reporting what's happening and giving us important insights, we're so grateful that you are here. I want to thank the Sign Institute team for putting this together. A lot of work goes into these events. Um, so thank you guys all for your hard work. But let's get right to this incredible book, this incredible conversation. Peter, why don't you go ahead and lead us? Right, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much for including us. Thank you guys so much for having us here. We just totally bought, you guys are gonna get like the error cards. We totally botched this stuff because you guys are the Eagles, but he signed all the books to the Wildcats. Yeah. So it's gonna be like all, <laughs> all jacked up. Now we're Northwestern Wildcats, so Cody's someone that I have great respect for, not just as a professional, but as a fellow Northwestern Ian. Um, we're gonna get, let you guys have some questions as well, obviously, so start thinking of those now. We'll talk for about an hour. And um, Cody, how many of these events have you, would you say, done? You were on, you may have seen them on Stephen Colbert last night. Did anybody see that? How many of these have you done? The, uh, well, the book just came out Tuesday, so this is the third event. And you have roughly how many sort of book events around the country? 16 more. 16. So we're competitive, okay? So we want to make this yeah. the best by far, okay? Yeah. So, I see it too because I've packed the audience with a, a bunch of former White House speechwriters over here. What's up, guys? Um, current colleagues and uh, my wife's best friends, a bunch of eagles are right in the front row. There we go. All right, so we're going to have a little bit of fun. There's some surprises for Cody in this conversation that okay. he doesn't know about, so we'll save those for you throughout, uh, throughout the course of it. But cool. the book is called Grace, and a lot of you have it in your hands. Some of you maybe had a chance to browse through it. I finished it. It is spectacular, and it really pulls back the curtain on what was a historic and unique time inside the Obama White House in 2015. So the first question for you as we start this conversation, Cody, is why, why this story? Why speak about those 10 days that were bookended by a racist massacre at the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston and ended with the Amazing Grace singing by the former President Barack Obama? Yeah, I, when, I left the, well, when I left the White House, I stayed with President Obama for four more years. Um, <clears throat> so it didn't feel right to write a book that was largely about him while he was still paying me. Um, but you know, but it, it took me a while. It took a while for those ten days to coalesce in my mind. As you're going through them, we were going through them along with everybody else, and it, they really kind of crystallized during the Trump years for me because we were sort of living through the opposite. But just to sketch it out, you know, like Peter said, it started with that race, racist act of terror in Charleston, and um, but then unfolded in surprising ways. Two days after that, the families of the victims forgave the killer on live television in court during his arraignment, which totally blew my mind, but if, if you're someone who's steeped in the AME church, which I was not, that's not a very surprising thing, that the tenets of that church are grace and forgiveness, but um, so we had to decide, you know, the president has to go out and speak the next morning, because that's just what presidents do, but, but there was a big debate in the West Wing as to whether 
he was going to give a eulogy in Charleston at all because um, he'd already done so many of those after mass shootings. And at the same time, we were prepping for, my entire team too, is prepping for um, big Supreme Court decisions coming the very next week on Obamacare and marriage equality. And there's a very real chance that tens of millions of people would get kicked off their health insurance. And millions of Americans would be told, no, you, you can't get married, you're second class citizen. So we're preparing for these, and, and my team's writing, you know, we had eight different speeches to write for every outcome. Because um, there were actually four outcomes for each case. You know, I, I remember at one point, Sarah was in my office, who's over there, and the lawyer came in and she was like, you know, there's actually a fourth outcome, and I was like, get out. <laughs> <laughs> We've already written 12 speeches for this, just get out. Um, but, you know, to, to, to kind of wrap it up, each of these events got to the question of who we are as a country and as a people. And, you know, I, I stole for this book President Obama's thesis from the Selma speech, which is that politics is not a clash of armies, but a clash of wills. It's a contest to determine the true meaning of America. And to have all these questions come at us in that one week about whether or not we're going to stand up to white supremacy. You know, do we really believe that the color of your skin um, shouldn't be a barrier? Are we going to stand up for LGBTQ brothers and sisters? Are we going to say that poor and working class people deserve health insurance in this country? Are we going to do something about guns? And it all came to a head in 10 days. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. So you talk about this being your effort, like what you hope to accomplish here was for this to be in some ways a broadside against the cynicism that Americans have experienced over the course of the last several years. Explain that, what you hope the people who pick up this book will feel and, and, and what it will accomplish. We've all felt it, you know, especially in the last several years, cynicism. And we felt it in the White House, too. I wanted to be clear about that in this book, that, that the work of governing is a grind, and you don't get victories every day. In fact, victories are very few and far between, and they only come because every single day you are trying to move the ball forward just a little bit. You know, we, we spent 2,922 days in the White House, and if you could go home each day just having you know, gained an inch on the field, eventually you're going to score a touchdown. And it doesn't happen often, and it's hard, and, and people get discouraged when they don't see change right away, and even more discouraged when they see us backsliding. So I, I wanted to write a book that just kind of blew up people's cynicism, you know, and made people believe in something again. And, and hopefully that's what this book does, and especially because we're here talking to students, which is really important to me. You know, there were a bunch of books when I was in college that inspired me to go into politics and to give it a shot. And all we're fed all day long is now just a steady stream of cynicism and you know, politicians are all corrupt, people, are, people in government don't do anything, there's nothing we can do together. And it's just not true. And, but it is hard and frustrating, and it takes a lot of effort. But it can also be, as you see from my friends here, and the fact that I married one of my coworkers, it can be a really wonderful profession. It can be collegial, it can even be fun and joyous. And you don't see that a lot, but, it, but it's real. Kristen Bartoloni. AU, class of 2008. Uh, what's, what, what's funny, we're going we're gonna to get some shouts out to his wife and their daughter, by the way. The book is named Grace. Their beautiful daughter's name is Grace Gracie as well. Um, you'll appreciate that my daughters, when they saw this book as I was reading it, of course, as I'm ignoring them as they're supposed to be going to bed, I'm reading the book says Grace, and my oldest says, Grace, why did Grace get a book about her? Why didn't I get a book? So, well, this is, it, you know, if we have a second kid, I'm going to have to write another book and make <laughs> massive therapy bills. Exactly. Exactly. So Grace on the softball team is getting a serious talking to this weekend. Um, if I can, I want to talk about, I think, particularly since we have a bunch of students in this conversation and something that I've asked Cody about personally, I think you all, as you write your papers, your assignments, the first thing you're thinking about is like when you're staring at that blank page, like where do you even start in these remarks? We'll talk about the unique challenges of writing for one of the best presidential orators, certainly of our lifetime, but of any that has existed. But how, how do you, what is your process when you're staring at that blank, blank sheet and you know that you've got to write a speech about any topic the, you know, the last one you can fathom even trying to write about is in the wake of something like what happened at Mother Emanuel. Yeah, I, I still don't have any secret formula. I mean, I've picked up some tricks over the years. One of them is talking to other people. And I would, you know, Terry's over there. Terry went to AU, by the way. Terry was my deputy director of speech writing, and, and no one's written more words on foreign policy for Barack Obama than Terry Zuplat, maybe for any president. But uh, his office was next door to mine, and if I was stuck, I'd go in there and try to talk it out. And sometimes I'd sort of come up with the speech before he'd even say anything. And I'd just be like, all right, thanks, man, and go back into my office. Um, but I teach speech writing now at Northwestern to seniors. And what I tell them that I wish I'd told myself back in the day is just start writing. I tell them, try to write the speech, the entire speech, in like five minutes flat. Um, this is for dramatic effect. This was by design. Know, nice. <laughs> 
and it can be simple language, um, but just figure out what the argument is. You can talk to a friend about it, talk to you know, your, your significant other, talk to your roommate, but try to write it in five minutes flat because any good speech, 10% of it is the drafting, 90% of it is editing and revising. So just get something on the page and then you can play with it. I think that's the best advice that a lot of us can take away. That's something I took away in practical terms about this conversation. One of the other things that strikes me, obviously, is that you were writing about a racist massacre, as we talk about what happened there in Charleston. But, but just broadly speaking, you were writing as a white speechwriter for the first black president. When on speeches like this, you're speaking about the issue of race. How challenging, what are the unique challenges that you experienced in that, and how did you overcome those? I hadn't noticed. Um, <clears throat> then I, I'm very honest about this in the book, too, um, because I struggled a lot being a, a white chief speechwriter for the first black president. Um, it was hard, and you want to, especially when things were changing as much as they've been over the last several years and, and, and during the decade, the eight years we were in office, it's a real struggle. Um, you are, when you're writing for somebody, you know, you're writing in their voice, not yours. You're not inserting your own point of view in there. One of the most important things about being a speechwriter is having a sense of empathy, trying to understand your audience, walk around in their shoes. But there are also limits to that. You know, you, you can, I could imagine what it was like to grow up a black man in America, but, but you, you, you can't really imagine it without having, no one has ever asked me for my ID or you know, stopped me for driving a car. I've never had to have the conversation with a child about what to do if a police officer comes up to you, um, or worse. So what I would do to overcome that is talk to him. I mean, the, our dirty little secret was that Barack Obama was our chief speechwriter. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would try to steal as much of his time as I could on the front end of any major speech and you know, ask him, what's the story we want to tell? What do you want to talk about? And sometimes you're more successful with that than others. The Charleston eulogy was, was particularly difficult because so much was going on that week that I just didn't get much of his time and he didn't want to give it. Um, so, and, and I'm very honest about this in the book too, the draft I gave him was not up to snuff. And uh, he tore up the last two pages of it and rewrote them longhand the night before. And what he put together was just something I never would have been able to reach. One of the cool things of this book that you'll see as you read through it is that Cody has some of the clips from these drafts that he sent to President Obama and then the longhand of the former president there, literally his like changes throughout it, which I personally think is very cool. It's, it is all with the National Archives right now. Thank you course. for pointing that's that out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's true, that's true. Uh, otherwise, I was gonna have to run to a camera real quick. But um, just to make this a little bit different, I know Cody, as he said, is gonna do at least 16 of these different things. The guy's a total hotshot and crushes all of his answers because he's, he's a smooth Northwestern Wildcat. But um, we, I reached out in advance because I'm a journalist to try to get some, some questions from the audience. So this one comes in from... Because I'm a journalist. His name is John Favreau. He's the former president's <laughs> chief speechwriter for his first term. John Favreau, who preceded you, on whose team you worked for a while, writes, uh, Cody, which one of us was a bigger drama queen when a last minute speech was forced upon us? Between me and John? Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, it was probably John. <laughs> I was supposed to FaceTime him in yeah. for this, but I watched that. I, I, I was probably the bigger panicker um, and I was probably the bigger, bigger drama queen when I was alone. And my poor wife took the brunt of it a lot of the time. Um, John had been with him longer, so he could be more honest about those things with him. They, we had, I write about this in the book, too, because it was very difficult to follow in John's shoes. You know, this was somebody who started out with Senator-elect Obama, um, and they spent two years together sharing an office in the Senate. You know, he'd, he'd call him by his first name, and they came up with these beautiful speeches on the campaign together, and, and John became this famous you know, the wonderkind of the White House. And then I have to step in and fill those shoes, and I just didn't have the same relationship with the boss at the time. Um, so it was a real challenge. I, I was a bigger whiner. John, I think, was, was more dramatic. But the, 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 I, I said this on, I just did Positive America with the guys last week, and, uh, or this week. Um, and I told John one of the most helpful emails he ever sent me was, he was in a full-blown panic um, the Saturday night before the 2012 Democratic National Convention speech. And, he emailed me and he said, I can't do this. I just can't do this. I'm going to quit. I, I cannot find the words. Why do we do this to ourselves? And I was like, you have no idea how helpful that email was to know <laughs> that somebody else goes through this too. Um, and Tom Vitor was like, dude, he sends me those emails like once a day. <laughs> 
Tommy Vitor also wrote a question, which is coming up <laughs> later, by the way. These are some of the people that work behind the scenes in the White House whose names may or may not be familiar, but you'll appreciate that I have like a dozen of them who offered some questions for tonight that I think will entertain part of this conversation uh, as we speak. I want to talk a little bit about how you got, this book is about Charleston in many ways, but before Charleston, there were a lot of different awful tragedies. One of them took place in Tucson. You were a 30-year-old speechwriter for the president when the shooting took place there, obviously, that nearly took the life of Gabby Giffords. It did take the life of many other uh, of her constituents that were at that location. Um, Politico at the time wrote, the task for the 30-year-old Northwestern graduate helped the president eulogize the victims of Saturday's deadly shootings in Tucson, praise the heroes and unite the nation, while at the same time rising above the bare-knuckle fight between the politicians and pundits about the dismal state of political discourse. No big deal, right? <laughs> Seems like a small task, right? You guys are cr crashing your final term papers, and that was his challenge on that night. Robert Gibbs, the former White House press secretary, asks, your life changed after that speech in Tucson, Cody, the Gifford shooting. Describe how it changed and what that meant to your work and to your personal life. How did you, how did you, that was your first sort of big moment, as it were, under the worst of circumstances, as a speechwriter to this president, to that president. Yeah, I mean, I, I still feel a little awkward about all of this because the job of a speechwriter is to neither be seen nor heard. Um, so why am I writing a book and appearing in front of people? I mean, we also live in the 21st century, and there's a press corps in the White House, as you know well, just looking for anything on anything. And so when we were flying back from Tucson, and I was still anonymous at this point, um, Gibbs was back in the back. Were you on that trip? Uh, Tucson, I was watching it from the White House. Okay. Gibbs, Robert Gibbs, press secretary, was in the back of the plane just briefing people on how the speech came together. Um, and someone asked who helped the president with it, and he said my name, and then he, he took the, step, the strange step of spelling my name out. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, I think that's right, I let think me that's check. Right. Um, and someone else in the press corps said a proud Northwestern Wildcat. We make sure to get it in everywhere. <laughs> um, but so I, you know, we got home at three in the morning, and I just went to sleep. And I, I emailed Favs and said, I'm coming in late tomorrow. And I wake up to 250 emails. And I'm just like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. And I had a missed call from Savannah Guthrie on the Today Show asking if I'd come on the Today Show. And I'm like, what happened? Because I didn't know Gibbs had even done that. And I'm just trying to figure out what on earth is going on. My mom called, and she's like, reporters are calling our house. Um, it, it just gets very strange. But you mostly feel sheepish because we, none, none of us wrote these speeches in isolation. You know, he, Gibbs should have read out everybody's name because we all, we all send drafts to each other before we send them to the boss. Um, and one of the things about being a speechwriter is none, none of our work is ever fully ours. You know, the rest of our team works on it. Fact checkers like my wife worked on it, the lawyers, the policy people, the president most of all. And there, the, I can't think of a speech I, I ever wrote that I have 100% ownership of. You talk about the fact checkers, including his wife. Um, you say the fact checkers had a different target than policy nerds. They didn't care about the speechwriters getting it right so much as they cared about Obama not being perceived as getting it wrong. And some of the back and forth here in the book, you say, your job is to make Obama sound like a human, yeah. right? Talk about that unique relationship you had with your wife. And as the fact checker, this is, you know, I'm sure my wife, would, she is my fact checker, but she didn't get paid, to, she doesn't get paid to do it, she just does it anyhow. But that she would call you out on the facts that you would get wrong or anything and challenge you on your speeches. It's just a miracle that we got married. <laughs> uh, we, we, met on, we met on her first day of work. And which is a delicate balance, because um, I was just taken immediately. But her job was literally, like you said, to tell me I'm wrong in 50 different ways every single day. <laughs> the genius of that job is she actually got taxpayer dollars to do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we, we usually got our squabbles out of the way at work. She was really a fireproofer is the best way to describe it. She made sure the president never said anything wrong or appeared with somebody he shouldn't be appearing at a place he shouldn't be. And her job is to prevent there, there are like a million other alternate timelines out there, you know, like in, like in Doctor Strange Multiverse where Barack Obama messed up somehow, and she made sure that never happened. Um, but it's still a challenge. I, you know, he gave a commencement address at UC Irvine on her, that would have been her 28th birthday, I think, and I ruined her birthday that morning by pushing back really hard on a bunch of her fact checks. I was like, I'm not taking this, I'm not taking this. And she was pretty mad at me for most of her birthday. Um, we made up, yeah, Katie remembers. Um, we made up by that night, but, but it was, you know, to go bigger into our White House, we were very fortunate um, that we all loved each other. And a lot of that came from working together on the campaign in 2007 that just, people remember it now as just like, you know, lightning in a bottle, but that was a slog. It was the longest primary campaign ever. 
when I had joined the campaign, we were down 40 points to Hillary in Iowa. It was not easy. Uh, but we became a family, and sometimes literally. They're, you know, I, I joke that a whole bunch of people met their spouses in the White House, and now they're having kids. And I always tell the president when I talk to him, he's got dozens and dozens of little grandbabies running around. Um, which this makes just got happen. weird. Yes. <laughs> Um, your friend Michael O'Neill, is Mike in the house somewhere here? They, they, must, they must be having a baby issue, too. Uh, yeah. He's got two little ones. One of the former roommates who also worked, um, they all lived together back in the day, says that there was one point when you were driving to the White House that I think the two of you, right, you and someone else, your wife was in the car, and for whatever reason, she didn't have the credentials, so she had to get out at the gates when you guys drove in and go through the gate. Yeah. The fact that you all stayed together after that is impressive. That's, well, don't forget your badge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I told her I'd tell her how this went tonight. Um, I was waiting until the camera was off. To yeah. say <laughs> exactly. So I want to ping off of some of the things you've been talking about here. You talked about some of the unique challenges that exist. You talked about your office and the team you have in that office. One of the things that's striking, and I've interviewed him uh, for the Today Show in the past, where we went into his office, the, the chief speechwriter, Terry's office as well, was, were literally, their offices were in the basement, as it were. No windows, no nothing low ceiling, low everything. You were back at the White House for the first time just a matter of weeks ago when the former president, since you departed, when the former president and his wife were there for the unveiling of their portraits. As I understand it, you went back and checked out your old office very briefly. It was described to me by Vinay Reddy, who is the current chief speechwriter to, Barack, uh, to, to Joe Biden. He wrote me as well. Everybody wanted in on this, but couldn't be a part of it in person. He said that you found it to be a bit lighter, and excuse me, and, the, and that the ceiling seemed a bit higher. Why was it? And, and describe what it's really like in that room. They actually renovated it after we left. Like it's, uh, <laughs> the walls are white now, not yellow. There's big, big he's got like this eight-foot curved monitor. Oops. Um, it's gorgeous now. Honestly, there's, you, there's still you no could windows. almost hit your head in that place. It's really, it had been that low. Obama came close a couple times. His, his, his body man, Marvin Nicholson, who was six foot eight, yeah. couldn't come in there and standing up. <laughs> um, we have more questions from others, but I'm going to save a couple for a minute. I want to get more to the process. You are thorough. Yeah, uh, no, I did, I did my homework. There's, the problem is that some of these are really good, so I want to make sure as I, keep a track, <laughs> as I keep track on time that we don't miss it. Before you worked for Barack Obama, you worked for Ted Kennedy. Um, and I just want to sense from you about the sort of different ways in which they work. Obviously, they are very unique politicians, but both very, you know, strong and strong-willed in terms of the positions that they, in many cases, shared, as it turned out, especially as it relates to health care for all Americans. But just talk about some of the behind-the-scenes experiences that define Ted Kennedy and how those, some of those compare to Barack Obama. Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned health care. I'll just start by saying for, for Barack Obama to finish the job of uh, the cause of Ted Kennedy's career was just a really special moving moment in the White House. And, you know, we still didn't finish the job of universal health care. We still have a ways to go, but, but we came closer than anybody else. I, I'm going to answer this a little differently just because we have students here who are looking for jobs and thinking about going into public service. Um, I, you know, when I left, I don't know if you guys know that we went to Northwestern. And <laughs> when I left Northwestern, there wasn't really a bridge to Washington. You're just kind of on your own. And so I, I moved out there. I literally knew one person in town from Northwestern. He was doing Teach for America. So um, he let me crash on his couch, but he's no help finding a job. And I came in thinking, you know, it was a hot shot. He went to a good school. I'd seen every episode of The West Wing. Like, someone's going to hire me like that. And it took me a long time. Um, I, I, I didn't even get into a lot of interviews. And when I did, I'd fail them. And I didn't have anyone to tell me that, that you don't get to skip a rung on the ladder, that you have to start low. And that's not just for paying your dues. I, so my first job ended up being an intern in Ted Kennedy's mailroom, and it became the best learning experience I ever had about politics. My job is literally to open letters from the American people and route them to where they needed to go. And you see that politics isn't like the West Wing at all. I mean, we're not idiots. We didn't get there thinking it's going to be like the TV show. You don't walk into a bar and say, this doesn't look like Cheers. But I start reading these letters from people, and, and, and they put really private things in there. Um, and their, their hopes and their pains and their struggles, and they're just, it, even when they're desperate, there is this hope in there that somebody on the other side is reading this letter and cares enough to do something about it. And I was just lucky that Ted Kennedy was one of those people who was just a master legislator, probably one of the best senators who ever lived. Um, he was a liberal lightning rod, and he relished being that, but he also passed more bipartisan legislation than anyone else in history. So he and Obama were very different. Um, a beautiful moment in my life was I'm now on the board of the Ted Kennedy Institute up in Boston, 
and they recreated his uh, Senate office in there just perfectly with everything. And I got to go to the opening with President Obama, and I got to write a speech for that. And we went up there, and I told him, I was like, man, I don't know if you've ever seen his office, but this is a perfect replica. And he said, I sat on that couch, and I asked Ted Kennedy if I should run for president. And he told me, um, this doesn't come along often. You know, and he, he started choking up thinking about his brother Bobby, and he said, when, when you feel that it's your time, then you do it. Far that I walk out, but rather than say that much more meaningful place on that, I, I do want to ask. Um, I do want to ask a little bit, if I can, about some, you know, again going back to the students that are sitting in this classroom. We talk about the State of the Union, okay? So you go to the State of the Union. State of the Union obviously is like a laundry list of all the things that you guys would have to write. You have a good story that you tell about when you were writing a State of the Union for President Obama, and. It brings in a little bit of jazz, a little bit of music as well. So tell folks that story, and it's something I think you guys will benefit by. I've already learned from it in terms of the way that you put stories together when you're doing public speaking uh, going forward. Yeah, this was a cool story. It, this, the State of the Union Address is a speech that every aspiring speechwriter dreams about writing until you actually get to do it, and you never want to do it again because you're just <laughs> you're stringing together. It's a laundry list, and every year we would sit down and be like, "This is the year we're not going to do a laundry list. We're actually going to do something really cool." And inertia just keeps you from doing that. And my poor team, they, they would just, they would handle every other speech and just come in and kind of sadly check on me every day and be like, are you okay? You know, how are you doing? Um, but so I, and, and, and it would ruin our Christmas every year, you know, because he'd, he'd want to draft when he got back from Hawaii. So in 2015, I'd ruined my third straight Christmas, banging out this draft and making sure everything was in there. And I was really happy with it for the first time. And I gave it to him eight days early, which was a new record. And I, I just waited and waited for him to, call me up and be like, this is great. Um, so, but I, I, it took two days, and then I get a call from the assistant saying, can you come upstairs? And so I go up there, and the president's in his private dining room having lunch, and he goes, sit down. Uh, and I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh my god, if I have to rewrite an 8,000 word speech, like by tomorrow, I might just leave. I'm going to pull a Favreau and just get out of here. Um, and he goes, how you doing? And I was like, I'm good. How was your holidays? They're fine. I'm like, well, you, what do you want? What you just tell me. <laughs> and he goes, so I, I, I read the speech, and I think we're in the best shape we've been in eight days out. And I'm just like, oh, like everything in my body relaxes. And then he goes, but, and I'm like, oh. And he goes, but we have eight days, so we can make it better. And the problem with it right now is everything is at a 10. Every sentence means something. Every word means something. There are no um, up and down moments. And I'm like, yeah, OK, I, I kind of get that. But like the point of the city union address is everything goes in here. And he, and he just thinks for a second, and he's like eating a raw carrot, because that's what he eats. <laughs> and he goes, he looks at me and goes, do you, let me ask you a question, you ever listen to jazz? And I'm like, not really. Um, he says, you ever listen to Miles Davis? And I said, not really. Um, I, I made some kind of cheesy joke about how I put it on when Kristen came over, but um, he said, well, you know what they say about Miles Davis? And I go, obviously not. <laughs> um, he said, it's, it's the notes you don't play. That's what made him so good. It's the silences. It's the space in between. And then I started to pick up what he was putting down. You know, he said, I need some of this speech down at a four, and at a six, and a seven, and a two. So I want you to go home tonight and pour yourself a drink, listen to some Miles Davis. Don't do any work, and then come back here tomorrow and find me some silence. Yeah, so he writes out his speeches and pauses and quiet moments because they say something too. They say something too. That's, that's so powerful, even for journalism. That's like the biggest lesson when we're doing interviews with a lot of these guys is you'll ask the question, they'll answer, and if, you move by, if you're not listening, you just move on to the next thought, then no one, no one marinates in that moment. So sometimes you'll ask a question, you'll see a tear maybe in someone's eye, you can see like there's a little emotion inside of them, and then you just stop talking, and you just look at them, and just sit there, and they fill in the silence. And that's inevitably for us as journalists, where you get the best sound bite, the most meaningful line, what's made so many journalists and performers, I think, so good in the company I play that in, in my reporting. But you talk about the State of the Union. You've talked a little bit about um, the research that gets done there. You say, among other things in the book, you say that research is the key to making a speech colorful and memorable. Talk about, as it will benefit a lot of people in this room, why that research, what that does to color uh, a script, a speech as you're writing. You, you read as much as you can, as widely as you can. Nobody is the font of every idea. And I would take ideas from, from books and songs and movies and, we, and you know, the news. But we, we also had an incredible research assistant named Susanna Jacob who would pull 
she would know what speeches were coming up and she'd pull interesting facts and figures about you know what town we were going to. I wanted to know how the football team is doing. I want to know what the mascot is. Um, people appreciate it. We take the time to learn about who they are and what they care about. And you know, for the example of speech like um, the one he gave at D-Day in, in 2014, I, I spent uh, a whole weekend reading um, part of the, uh, I can't remember, the trilogy about, about the World War II. I can't remember the name right now, I'm blanking. But I, I pulled out all these beautiful little trinkets and pieces from, I wanted to know what all the soldiers who were about to do that landing were doing the night before, you know, when nobody knew it was coming. And I worked that into the opening of the speech to try to do this kind of beautiful moment before getting to the actual D-Day. Same thing in the Selma speech. I, I really wanted to know what all those marchers were doing in the hours before they set out to the bridge. So that's what I mean by research. Read up on something. Find you know, something interesting, something beautiful, something memorable that, that'll stick with your audience and, and, and they'll take home and tell other people about it. And one of the things that Susanna, your teammate in this effort, did so well as you write is that she didn't give you an encyclopedia of information. She helped boil it down when you were trying to write about the specific individuals. Because you know how it is when you're writing a paper or whatever else. You just have so much to try to deal with. And she helped synthesize it for you so you could find those things that really would ring true when you Yeah. What an awful thing to have to, we had a template for mass shooting. And what an awful thing to have to have. But, but, but we knew that the president would have to go give a eulogy. Susanna would go read up on the people that he had to memorialize and find interesting things about their lives. What, what do we want the president of the United States to tell people about them now that they're gone? And she would just kind of snap into action and start pulling those things together. And just what an awful thing to have to, have to do. leads me to the idea of empathy, and as you and Kristen talked about on occasions when you were struggling to find the words in some of these speeches, she said, you aren't you the one always telling people that empathy is the most important quality in a speechwriter? Why is empathy so important as a quality for a speechwriter? Well, look at who I am, and this, this, this is why I struggle with being a speechwriter sometimes. I'm a relatively privileged white kid from the north side of Chicago. Um, what do I know about the world? You know, my first, and I'll freely admit this, as embarrassing as it is, my growing up on the north side of Chicago and then moving up to the north suburbs, my first interaction with, like, true pain and racism and poverty came from books, not from experience. And if you're writing for the President of the United States, you won't have as much life experience as you can, but the way Washington works, and let's be honest, the way the world works, is it ends up being a bunch of white people who got fancy educations. Um, and so, you know, we all have work to do to make our teams more diverse, not just for the sake of checking a box, but because, they, because different people bring different perspectives to things. And the President of the United States should be speaking to everybody. So we would try to stretch our empathy muscles as much as we could. And, and, and when we couldn't fully get there, you know, I remember before uh, when, when, when we were working on um, remarks that week for what if Obamacare was, was knocked down, I, I reached out to a couple letter writers who'd written in about how Obamacare changed their lives, and I said, tell me what would happen if, if it went away. Because um, I didn't, you know, I, going back to me, I, I was never in danger that week of somebody killing me for the color of my skin, or I had just gotten engaged to Kristen, no one was going to tell me we couldn't get married, I wasn't going to lose my health insurance, and now we had to write all these speeches um, talking to people who dealt with those things. And so it helps to have a diversity of experience on your team. Uh, we have another another question that comes from the room. This is from Jen Psaki, uh, who worked in the Obama White House and uh, was formerly the press secretary. You may recognize that name, obviously, in the Biden White House. She writes, did you prefer the campaigns or the White House more? The campaigns. Why? It, 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 it's so much more fun, first of all. You're not, you're not responsible for anything. <laughs> you know? um, the second campaign, we totally were. But, but the first campaign, you get, when you, as, especially as a speechwriter, you get to write the vision thing. Where are you going to take this country? And you have a foil. You have another side. You have an opponent. You have an opposing vision. When you get in there and the economy is losing $800,000 jobs a month and everyone's mad at you, it's a little more difficult. Um, yeah, the campaign. It's not even close. Uh, speaking, of the, speaking of the campaign, and Jen has a second question. <laughs> um, Okay, one thing that you write about that was so interesting to me is if you guys look back, remember back in 2008 where Obama obviously, when he won Iowa, like, you know, it was an avalanche. Everybody all of a sudden was like, holy cow, you know, history just happened. And then he went off to New Hampshire, and this was going to be, you know, this was going to be a key moment. Was, did he have enough juice in him to do it again? He obviously lost to Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. And in the speech that 
then candidate Obama delivered in New Hampshire. Basically, you changed, as I think I read, one sentence. John Favreau, I think, was behind the speech. Changed one sentence in the entire speech, had he won or had he lost. Which is to say, the message remains the same whether you win or you lose. You concede, and then you move on. Talk about that, because I think that says something that a lot of people can benefit by as they try to find a thesis and try to deliver a message in whatever they may be writing. Yeah, I had absolutely nothing to do with that speech, so I'll talk freely about it. <laughs> they, you gave me, you know, a, a little electricity just around my neck too, because I remember it. I was in Ames, Iowa, and, and and I was in, I was, it was like five degrees, and I was just trying to park my car outside a caucus site when we got, you know, we had these ancient blackberries. We got an email saying we want Iowa, and just like, you could hear people on the street screaming, and it just, it still kind of gives me tingles. Um, but so I think New Hampshire was five days later, if I'm not mistaken. And they only wrote, it was John and Adam Frankel and Ben Rhodes, and they wrote a victory speech, and that was it. There was no concession speech. And as the day went on, David Plouffe started. Think about that for a second. They didn't even write a concession speech, right? Yeah. So then he loses. They're like, what are we going to do? David Plouffe starts saying as the day goes on, hey, this isn't looking good. Um, so all they did was deleted the very first sentence that just um, uh, said we won, basically, and instead changed it to congratulating. Hillary Clinton on her victory, and every other word in the speech was the same, and that was the Yes We Can speech, like the one that Will I Am turned into a music video. But Nobody ever remembers that that speech comes from a night that he lost. You yeah. remember that. It's like, oh, he's on top of the world. That was the night that he lost to Hillary Clinton, and yet it was the speech that became so iconic for the, for the Obama campaign. That struck me. Ben Rhodes offers a question as well, but we'll get to his question. Why did you do all yeah, this? I, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my bosses, because I missed my slot on Nightly tonight, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Let me uh, let me go through it a little bit if I can. Oh, Jen Saki, her second question is good. You described some of the best days in the book. What were the toughest or worst days that you experienced when you were working in the Obama White House? Newtown was the worst day. Uh, the I, president said the same. Yeah, I hope that's true for everybody. It's you know you go into office. We had just won re-election. Spirits are high. We're, John and I shared an office at that point. He's working on the second inaugural address. I don't know what I was working on. And then uh, Alyssa Mastromonaco, the deputy White House chief of staff, comes in to tell us that. There's been a mass shooting in a in an elementary school in Newtown, and as the day goes on, you find out just how horrible it was. I mean, that's that's the worst day. Um, that was the only day ever that uh, one of the president's assistants called the first lady and asked her to come to the Oval Office. Um, that's as bad as it gets. Other bad days, it's, it's it's hard to compare to that. I mean, we went through a lot of mass shootings, of course. Um, I'm struck as I look at this room. You, who's a student? Raise your hand if you're a student. So if you're a student now, you're between the ages of 18 and 21. Yeah, this was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you guys were roughly the same age as those students who lost their lives. That's kind of striking to me as a dad, those girls who are about exact age right now, right? And this is what that generation was like. And these girls who had their lives taken away. Yeah, in, so in an effort to just change the subject and lighten the mood, um, other kinds of bad days. When the Green Bay Packers came to the White House after winning the Super Bowl, <laughs> I, I took the afternoon off and I made Tyler write it. Um, as long as we're as long as we're talking sports, this one comes from Carly Keenan, your sister. She says, <laughs> she says, uh, "Hey, congratulations! Clearly, you're successful. Can I have the opening day Cubs ticket?" Sure. Okay. I'll report back. That's the easiest one. On that, Ben Rhodes again was one of the national security deputy advisors. There is the name that's familiar. You probably see him on MSNBC often. Was a, a good contact for me to help me better understand the way the world works. His question to you, Cody: What was your best night out on a foreign trip? Well, that's just a setup. I told this story on Colbert last night. We we were in we were in Paris. Terry was there. Um, uh, it was the night before the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And I just, you, you can't screw up a speech on D-Day, you know, because it's about D-Day. Like, if anybody writes a bad speech about D-Day, you just, you should hang it up. Um, but so I, a room full of people that are hoping one day to write a speech about D-Day. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to write the best. I wanted to write the best one. And then it, it had been widely understood that the best one was the one that Peggy Noonan wrote for Ronald Reagan in 1984. I wanted to write one that was better. Um, just out of, like, pure, petty competition. <laughs> Um, but also, to, to be more serious, there, there are just fewer and fewer living veterans from D-Day each year, and you want to do right by them. So I, I wove three of them into the speech. I actually got to talk to them on the phone. It was pretty extraordinary. Um, but so I, I crushed this speech, and we're, we're about to land in Paris, and I was hopeful. I gave it to the president early because I was hopeful 
that he would not want a lot of light, not a lot, want a lot of work on. He comes back and he goes, "This is great, man. I have no edits." Well, guess what? That means I have no work to do tonight. Um, and again, we all loved each other and, and didn't get to hang out enough. You know, so when you're in Paris, I, I, Jen Saki helped pull together a dinner for 12 of us. We all went out and had a really nice dinner together. But as a, as the night went on, uh, a crew of four of us ended up staying out till dawn. Um, because it's Paris. How many are in Paris? You know, I think it was only my second time since my first time since college. I feel like it was moving or something. Keep going. Yeah. So we we finally get back to the hotel. Um, as everyone, it was a little embarrassing. As everyone was like fully dressed and packed and waiting to get into the motorcade, and the White House Deputy Chief of Staff comes up and goes, "You guys need to get your asses upstairs, change, get dressed, and get down here. We're leaving you in Paris." Um, and somebody dined us out to the president, who you know made fun of us all day, and we we got our comeuppance. I mean, it was it really was extraordinary to be there um, at Sword Beach and to to pay tribute to the vets. And the president gave a great speech, but then karma karma messed with us because President Sarkozy was engaged in a tough reelection battle, and so to boost his polls, he put on a three-hour reenactment of D-Day on the beach with like with like two thousand people there. The Queen of England was there, you know, a bunch of foreign leaders were there. It was like ninety-five degrees, so. Rhodes and I were just sitting under the bleachers, being like, "When, when is, when are the bombs going to stop falling?" <laughs> I was there that day. It was punishment to be high. Like, I do remember that. Although I wasn't hungover, so my experience is. <laughs> um, okay, so our time. So we're winding down towards questions from you. So get those questions together that you want to ask. But I do want to just make sure uh, before we finish this conversation that I tack on a couple other good ones that came. I, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Because you're. I'm trying to remember who else I'm doing this Actually, with. Actually, I'll be the one asking the questions today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you, I think you're the only journalist I'm doing this with, and I'm just very curious because you were in the White House during those ten days. I just wonder what what you remember and how do you how do you cover things? Because like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Writing this book was relatively easy thinking about it, but in the time, you're not like, okay, this is day three. How did you cover all these events, and, and do you think of them as fitting together? I, I don't know, like free form it. Is this, is this an off the record conversation or an on the record conversation? <laughs> you know what? What I remember a couple things about about those days. First of all, why this is compelling to me is because it pulls back the curtain, but you don't have to know a lot of these figures to be moved by the way Cody tells his story. The interaction he had with the former president. But what strikes me as we talk about those days is is to understand. My job is to sort of say what we're hearing from inside. And here's what's actually going on inside. So, for example, I'm proud that I, I won an Emmy Award for my coverage of you guys, uh, the Affordable Care, uh, excuse me, the, the same-sex marriage Supreme Court decision. And it was because on that day, you know, it, there's a strategy. You guys had all these prepared statements, as you write about in the book. And my challenge is, at 10 a.m., the Supreme Court announcement's going to come. Pete Williams now is retired. Is going to get on TV. I'm going to learn what the decision is from Pete Williams, the same way we did too. Yeah. you guys learn it. And then after Pete's done, they're going to go to me at the White House and say, "Hey, Peter, what's the White House say?" I'm going to be like, "What's the White House say?" <laughs> the White House just found out as quickly as you did. And I was fortunate that on that day, some of the people in the White House were texting me in real time their reactions and was able to give like some colorful instant reactions from in the hallways, up in the council's office, and elsewhere. Um, but, you know, as someone who, like, I do this as a journalist because I, too, want to make a difference in this country. I care about America. My desire is to give, I don't advocate for Democrats or Republicans. I advocate for the facts. And my job is just to get the closest version of the facts I can at all times. And so, you know, for me, who's trying to get as close to them as I can and then reading the backstory and understanding what actually the facts are and what's really going on in real time, I think it does give you an understanding of the journalism that you see today. And a lot of times you're reading the first draft. I mean, our job is the first draft of history. But it's the experiences like those that Cody shared that ultimately give it color and nuance and really give you a better understanding of, of history with all the context uh, that it deserves to be in. Um, OK, back to my question. Thank you. <laughs> um, this one comes from Stephen Keenan, AKA Killer. That's Cody's father. <laughs> he, was, he was on a road trip with your mom when they answered. Um, he says, how did your relationship to President Obama change once he was out of office? Four years he spent as chief speechwriter when entering his second term. The next four years he spent as chief speechwriter when he left office. Could he be more challenging in terms of the content that he wrote about? Was it more fun for you in those times? We were more relaxed, for sure. We, we shared an office over in Georgetown. Um, I still called him Mr. President or Sir. I never got that colloquial with him. 
you know, it's funny, he, he was working on his memoirs the whole time, and as somebody who just finished a book, you get a little, uh, you can get a little itchy when you're writing a book. You can get a little curt. Um, and so I, I think we, we became closer in terms of, um, we bicker a little bit like, like brothers, sort of, in a way we didn't in the White House. That's it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this, one, this one comes from the, the woman in the passenger seat. This is Marilyn Keenan, Cody's mom. She writes, why are you always so hard on yourself? <laughs> because I'm a writer. That's what we do. I mean, I, I think any, any good writer tortures themselves at all times with uh, self-loathing, self-doubt, you know. But it, it was also, it was just hard to write for Barack Obama. Um, we always wanted to impress him with every draft, you know, even though we would come to understand that the way he viewed it was as, as a collaboration and what he really wanted from us was something to work with, but we wanted to impress him anyway. Um, and when you, when you feel like you're, you're not there, uh, it, it can be a pretty dark experience. Um, you guys will appreciate if I, can, if I can color this image for you quickly when I was making this call, talking to folks over the last week in advance of this conversation, because again, I wanted A, you to be the most different, interesting, and fun for this guy who's done a bunch of these so far. I'm not done, don't worry. Um, <laughs> was that they were listening to your recorded, your like audio version, the audio book yeah, yeah. The of this as they were driving across the country, and so they were like, they were like quieting Cody in the background talking as we were talking really quickly. They're like, we're on day 10 right now, so we kind of have to go quick. This is really, it's really good. <laughs> the audiobook is really good, by the way. I thought that was pretty entertaining for me personally. Um, okay, who else do I have that, who else do I have some from? So listen, if, if we can then, and, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, just two, two last thoughts, kind of circling back to where we started, which is, what was your route after the speech is done, when it's finally out of your hands, when there's nothing more you can do to change it? after making sure it says good morning, not good afternoon, and the teleprompter has happened on one occasion that you got some help to make sure that mistake wasn't made, nor would the president have accidentally said it, I trust. But what was your routine? How did you watch these speeches? Um, I know what you're getting at. It's, I, I usually watch them with the Budweiser and Chicken Tenders. That's what I was getting at. <laughs> but there's this, um, it, it's, a, it's this weird dividing line of emotions when you hand in a speech, because before that I'd, I'd just be a mess of panic, self-loathing, um, depression, being hard on myself. And then the second you hand it over, it's total relief, right? So why don't you hand it over earlier and get that relief earlier? Because you still just want it to be as good as you can. But it, it, it's, that's one of the interesting things about being a speechwriter is that everybody wants you, you know, before, before the speech is given. Everybody wants to get their stuff in there. They want to know what's in it. They want to know what you're working on. And then as soon as he gets up to give the speech, nobody cares about you anymore. You know, you're just useless until the next one comes along. And I actually kind of loved that feeling to just suddenly be left alone and crack a beer or something and sit back and watch him on TV. So like these huge historic moments are happening and sometimes you're in this book as you write, pass, basically pass out on the couch. Yeah, the night, all these girls went with, with Kristen down to the White House when it lit up like a rainbow, you know, the, the day of marriage calling the day of Mason Grace, but I, I hadn't slept in three days so I went to sleep at eight o'clock and missed the entire thing. Honey, you guys go enjoy. Yeah, they tried, they, you guys tried to wake me up and I just was not moving. As long as we're talking about roommates, this comes from Tommy Vitor, one of your former roommates. He writes, rank your roommates in order of favorite. <laughs> Kristen. <laughs> my, my, my other roommate's back there stretching. <laughs> uh, O'Neill's in the house. We did your questions, Mike. Yeah. Don't worry. Um, I mean, only, Kristen was first. Only one other roommate made fresh homemade pasta. Um, that was Michael. But I'm not going to rank them. Okay. As long as Mike, as long as Mike's here right now, Mike, please take a stand so everyone can see one of the, one of the roommates from there. Thank you. One of my one of my favorite pages about compares and contrasts, Michael and Tommy. Um, Tommy tells me a good story. I gotta get to you guys. Tommy tells me a good story quickly. Apparently, there was a cooking class at you guys' place, right? Uh, the the day of the Osama bin Laden operation. Um, I guess I'll just tee it up with what was that all about? Vitor was watching the Celtics. He was in the Celtics jersey. What was the deal? Well, that was a, an extraordinary week and weekend, and I'll, I'll keep this really, really tight. I was writing a commencement address for the president to deliver that Friday. Uh, the Bin Laden was a Saturday, and, and then he announced it to the country on Sunday. So I traveled with the president on Wednesday to try to get him a look at this commencement address. And it was the first time he ever snapped at me. You know, I went into the conference room at Air Force One. I tried to get him a look at it, and he goes, what do you want? And he had never done that before or since. And I just, I just kind of like melted in the floor. I was like, nothing. And, just, <laughs> and then on Friday, we had, we had a crazy day of travel. We went down to Tuscaloosa because there, uh, there was all this tornado damage. We went to Cape Canaveral for what was supposed to be the final shuttle mission ever. 
and Gabby Giffords was there, and it got scrubbed for weather. Then we went to Miami to do this commencement address, and we're flying back on our first one, and I'm showing the president his jokes for the correspondence dinner, and he's super loose at this point, um, laughing his jokes. Saturday, he roasts Donald Trump at the correspondence dinner. And so Sunday morning, we're all at our house, um, hungover, just hanging out, watching sports. Tommy's wearing his Larry Bird jersey. And then he gets a call that he has to come into work. Michael's Wait, real quickly, Mike O'Neill, apparently, according to Tommy, is hosting a random cooking class with a bunch of randos with a chef from Posto. Yeah. <laughs> there are strangers in our kitchen cooking pasta. Um, so Tommy gets this email saying, you got to come to work. And he goes, ah, what do you think? Do I have to put on a suit? And I'm like, yeah, you probably should. And we don't know why. And a couple hours later, you know, I'm sitting there with Fabs, and we get an email from Ben Rhodes that says draft remarks on uh, President of the United States announcing the, the, the killing of Osama bin Laden, and we're just like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't show up in itself yeah. uh, uniform for that one. Um, my, la my last question is just going back where we started, but it's the theme of the book. The book is about grace. <clears throat> Amazing grace, obviously, were the words the president ultimately sang that day that became such an iconic moment that everybody uh, certainly remembers. And if you don't, Cody writes it so well that you'll be reminded of it even without watching it. Um, the simple question that everybody asks you, certainly, and these people are included in that, is was that like pre-planned? Was, was that all along going to happen, or how did that come to be? No. You don't write in there, you know, sing here in brackets. <laughs> um, but it also, it wasn't my idea. It was his idea. You know, I, 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 I write very honestly in the book about how I just couldn't get the draft to where it needed to be, and he really, he just drew a, one line through pages three and four, which is just a horrible gut punch. I had had the phrase Amazing Grace in there, and then right there is where he cut everything else, and he wrote out the lyrics, and he built the structure of the back half of the speech around it. Um, and then that morning, you know, we, we had just, he had just finished speaking about marriage equality, so just everyone at the White House, everyone's hearts are full um, for you, not just our LGBTQ members of staff, but for those of us who cared about him. Everybody's hearts were full, and the president had, you could tell he was visibly moved by how far the country had come so quickly on an issue. And, so we're on the helicopter to go to Andrews, and he goes, you know, if it feels right, I might sing it. And my first reaction is usually to be risk averse with him, to say, well, let's think this through. Um, but in that case, I was just like, all right, you do you. Uh, and, he, and he did. And he, you know, speaking of silences, he paused for 11 seconds during that speech before he sang. And I knew he was going to. You remember that? You remember that little pause, and everybody sort of watched that? I was like... I knew he was going to, but my first thought, I was worried that people watching would think he'd lost a page or something and didn't know where he was going. And then he, and then he started singing. And, and, uh, it's he just started, by the way, he started low, right? Why is that? Well, yeah, that's right. So I asked him, I asked him about the pause afterwards. It's like, was that for dramatic effect? And he goes, no, man. So this is like the same thing when he, when he said, you know the thing about Miles Davis. That's how he liked to ask questions. He goes, you know the thing about Amazing Grace? I'm like, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you got to start low. Because otherwise, when you get to a wretch like me, your voice cracks. So he's always thinking about the stagecraft of it. And, and Questlove, uh, from The Roots, tweeted out you know, right after that. He was like, he's like, dog, the president just hit E flat. Like, he's collabing with Stevie Wonder. And, <laughs> and that's the only, the president never cared about praise. Like, if you told him good speech or whatever, he'd be like, yeah, I know. But if you, if you read him something like that, He'd be like, the blackest blues note ever. <laughs> it was like after the, after the 2012 convention speech, the writer Shea, Shea Serrano tweeted, man, that speech was like Jordan switching hands against the Lakers. And we read it to Obama. He was like, just like Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the one tweet you showed him, right? You showed him yeah. Questlove when he was done. All right, you guys turn. Hopefully we've touched on some of these things, but I'm sure there are other thoughts that you guys may have now. So raise hands. There's some microphones yeah, in the room. Yeah, we've got Ava and Caleb who are going to go around. We are going to have students ask questions first. So if you could say your first name and what school you're from, too, when you ask a question. And if Mike doesn't make it, we trust you. Can, we can talk can about Can we just it. also thank Peter for making this so special? Yeah. Yeah. endorsements, right, but I, I would retweet this guy as an endorsement anytime. This book is Thanks, spectacular. Man. I really encourage you guys to pick it up if you haven't already. Please, first question. Hi. Hi. I always hate the sound of my voice. Uh, <laughs> I'm Tyler, senior at studying political science, and a question I have is, after you got an A rating from the pres, an A plus from the president on a speech, but then the news media, like, Criticize his speech. Did you feel bad? Not him. Not his, his colleagues on the right. Let's just. His 
colleagues on the right, did you ever feel bad or did you ever feel, oh, I could have done something better to not get that crit critique? I, I always felt that way on my own about every speech, that I always could have done something better. I'd go back in time and edit every speech now. Um, no, criticism from the right didn't bother me. It, I mean, every once in a while you might actually find a kernel in there that's like, you know what, that's an interesting point of view that I hadn't considered and that it, it would bug me. I mean, remember, I remember flying back from Tucson, the right was all spun up that people in the arena were cheering during the eulogy. It was in a basketball arena at the University of Arizona. And I remember thinking, what a ridiculous thing to criticize the president for. Like, if, if, if these people who have, you know, the, the whole country's been looking at their town for a week, if this is the way they want to heal and move on, let them do it. You know, we didn't orchestrate that. Um, that one's always just stuck in my head, but like, did I care what Tucker Carlson had to think, had to say about an Obama speech? No, not really. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I just, I, I was, I, every speech not at me, you know, I was never satisfied. And, and I don't know, maybe there were two or three times ever where I got an A plus, And that's when I'd go on an all night bender in Paris. <laughs> My name is Peyton. I'm a CLEG major here at American University. That's communications, law, economics, and government. You mentioned the rungs in government here in Washington, D.C. I'm currently also on rung one as an intern in the mailroom. I'm curious how, over time, you learned to control your own voice and opinions and kind of meld that into Obama's voice. That's a great question. Um, he, he always sought out our opinions. He wanted us to push back. He wanted everybody's advice in the room. The worst was when he would, he, would, he would force us to make the opposing argument. He might have already made up his mind, but he would still force you to make the other argument anyway. But, but I, I don't think you ever want to lose your voice or your opinion when you're in the room with powerful people. You'll have bosses like that. Um, any boss that's worth their salt is going to value what you have to say. They might not act on it, they might not agree with you, but I think they'll respect the fact that you stood up and said, there's just so much inertia in Washington and in politics and groupthink, right? It's always very valuable when one person decides to buck the group thing and say, hey, guys, we're, we're all saying the same thing here. What if it's wrong? Um, I think that's really valuable, and that's the type of thing that'll, that'll help you out. Thank you. Good question. Steve. Thank you, Craig. Hello. My name is Alex Faxon. I'm an economics major from California. I want to ask, how do you balance writing a speech about a political adversary and their ideological differences without coming off as disrespectful? Is that even a concern? Yeah, absolutely. For Obama, it absolutely was a concern. I, I remember there were a couple times I wrote lines in um, into speeches during the 2012 re-election, and he would take them out and say, don't do this. You know, he actually prefers to do it with humor. That's when he's at his best on the campaign trail. When he, he'll just, I, I remember I, I wrote this, um, I drafted the... Uh, a speech to the United Auto Workers in 2012, and one of the headlines was, you know, Obama uses withering mockery to take down Mitt Romney, and I was like, that's the sweet spot. Um, just jokes, humor, there's not enough of it in politics. And, it, you, you know, I, my guess is Obama will be out on the campaign trail in the next couple weeks, and he usually unveil, he usually let, lets loose with like a comedy routine. Um, he certainly did in 2020 when he was out campaigning for Joe Biden. That's the best way to take someone down. We don't need more. I don't think people really get excited about vitriol and then just being mean and nasty and petty. You know, if you can if you can poke some fun um, at other people's ideas, that's always a better way to go. Thank you. Sure, please. Uh, my name is Michael Martyr. I teach AP government politics in New Jersey. Right on. And my kids wanted to know what kind of writer were you in high school? And as as you know, kids that bemoan papers that aren't good writers, what advice would you give? I love this question. So uh, one of the last events I have on my schedule right now next month is in Ridgefield, Connecticut, where I went to high school. And my conversants are my two favorite English teachers from high school, Kathy Wassel and Bob Cox. Um, Kathy Wassel was my 11th grade English teacher, and she gave me the first C I'd ever gotten in my life. And, you know, like an entitled little shit, I, I went up to her <laughs> after school and was like, what, you know, what is the meaning of this? Um, <laughs> And I'd probably just gotten a C because no one, a lot of other teachers, look, I, I grade papers now too. It's hard to give lousy grades. Um, but she, rather than just throw me out, sat down, much like the president would, and she walked me through everything I'd done wrong. And no one had ever done that before. And I just, I'd had no idea. And everything she said was right, and she made me a better writer. Um, I, I always liked writing because I loved reading. I was a huge book nerd as a kid. Like, I would spend my summers in the 
Wilmette, Illinois Public Library trying to win the competition for who could read the most books. Um, and that, that, you know, I, I think good writers have to be good readers. Um, so yeah, I loved writing and, and I, it turns out getting that C was one of the most important things that's ever happened to me. Sure, and like I alluded to earlier, it was, it was the best learning experience I've ever had. Um, it was like a second degree right out of college. And when you can get over yourself, you know, at first it was like, ugh, they really want me to go get them a sandwich and walk the senator's dogs. It, it, one of the most important things that ever happened to me was also really embarrassing. The office manager sat me down and was like, listen, we like you, um, but sometimes you've got an attitude when we ask you to do stuff and we will throw you out of here because there are a million other kids who would do this job. And like, thank God somebody said that to me. And from then on, I was determined to be the best photocopier you have ever seen, you know, <laughs> the best lunch getter you've ever seen, the best memo runner. But if you also keep your eyes open, you get to learn a lot. And you know, we had one, uh, one of the worst tasks was we had this this brilliant lawyer on staff who just never bothered to learn how to type or use a computer. He printed every email he got, including the ones that were like reply alls. He'd just go through reams of paper, and there was nothing we could do to stop him. Um, but he would come by my desk with like five pages of handwritten legal stuff and just he'd just say type this up and keep walking and at first you're like what the hell man I'm doing other stuff that's not nice but then you realize he's writing some really important memos on legislation with things that I, you don't read in the news and I'd never understood before and so you can if you keep your eyes open you can learn all sorts of amazing stuff okay final question right here hi um, I'm Colin I'm a freshman at the uh, School of Public Affairs so I'm wondering so historically if you think about the famous speeches in American history. Uh, you think about the presidents who gave them, not the speech writers. So how did you grapple with and did you ever struggle with knowing that you know, you're putting your blood, sweat, and tears into this work when most of America is not even going to know your name? No, that's, and that's as it should be. You know, I, like I said before, I'm still, I, I have, I'm, I'm grappling with the fact that I've written a book about speech writing because we, we shouldn't. Like, we're not supposed to be here. Um, our work is supposed to benefit the boss and, and to a larger extent to the country. Um, it's just no one's no one's anonymous anymore. There's there's it's funny because you know all my team is back there and there's this there's this this club of presidential speechwriters um, and we're all supposed to go have dinner with them in a few weeks. I mean they're all like 90 now, but um, <laughs> everybody knows who they are. So I am conflicted about writing about this, but the one thing I'm not conflicted about is that Barack Obama was our chief speechwriter, and I, you know I'm not BSing this here. If you've ever seen a photo Pete Sousa has taken of the president's word, you know that he has torn up speeches and rewritten them and, and you know, if, if you ran into President Obama today, he would probably tell you that he wrote the 04 speech by himself, the one that made him famous. He still tells us that. Um, <laughs> so, and that's, in, and that's in this book too, but I, I wanted to be very honest about how, how good a writer he is, that he was our chief speech writer, and also how difficult it was to, to try to keep up with him. Everyone, Cody Keenan, thank you so much. I just want to take a minute. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you enjoyed the evening, Sign Institute wants to bring you more incredible opportunities like this. There's information out there. We have refreshments for you out there. But first, Cody, your sign family got a little something for Gracie. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm trying to make her a wildcat. So you want her to be an eagle? All right. We're, we're desperately trying to, so thank that's, you. Their, that's for Gracie, but thank you so much for coming back to campus, for spending time with us, and thank you for everybody for being here tonight, so thank you. Thank you.